Hello and welcome. This is the Bits vs. Byte podcast. I am your host, Arme Grigic, and today with me is uh, Tim Zuidgeest. He is a co-founder at STNT Research. Hi welcome. There. Thank you. So um, let's start off uh, with the beginning. So uh, could you tell a little bit about your background and also how you uh, came to start STNT Research? Ooh, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> uh, go back as uh, far as you want. <laughs> okay, so well, it, I mean, it, it all started basically when I was uh, 16 and I wanted to go on a holiday um, with my girlfriend. I didn't have any money, but I did sort of know how to build websites. Uh, and so I started out with building websites first. Uh, and that sort of laid the foundation for why I started SCNT, not so much because of the websites, although the more technical stuff does help, yeah. uh, but more in the sense of that I know or I knew how it was to yeah, sort of run a small company, right? It's, it's a one-person company, of course. Um, and so I had that. Uh, I went on to first study uh, political science, which is a sort of feels off. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> totally different. Really interesting, though. Um, but after that, I um, came on the, or I saw the study, Economic and Consumer Psychology. And when I saw it and I followed the first introductionary course, uh, I saw it and I was like, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. I already knew that I wanted to do something in marketing. So the political science stuff was a bit of a detour. Um, and I also knew I want to start a company in this. Uh, and that's also where I uh, met my other co-founder, Tom. Uh, and that's why we started it yeah mm. and uh how did you get to um so you said that the the kind of um the kind of course that you did uh was speaking a lot to you uh, why was that so w what was kind of what spoke to you about that uh those introduction because you did some introductory courses uh, what, what spoke to you about that particular kind of direction was that because of the marketing stuff or why was that well i guess two things in it. Uh, first of being that uh, a lot of things in psychology feels contraintuitive, yeah. but when you see it, it immediately sort of makes sense in a way that you think, oh, well, it's so powerful that you can steer behavior in a way that you didn't think was possible. Yeah. It felt like the, sort of like the true answer to marketing. Uh, and that was also the part where I was really interested in because I sort of yeah, felt that I could see how I could steer behavior in a sense that marketing would want you to do in that sense. Although if you look at marketing from a more technical uh, point of view, so not psychology, but marketing, uh, it's more about how many euros do you put in there and what's the outcome, what's the ROI. So it's more technical in that sense. Mm -hmm. And this was more, yeah, human-like, I want yeah. to say. Yeah, so the psychological part was something that drew you, yeah? Yeah, for sure. And, and to point one out in particular, uh, and that's always the one thing that I say why I really wanted to study this was a, a an example of uh, an eye tracking study mm -hmm. uh, so it's really so yeah based on the podcast it's hard to show right now but you yeah. have to sort of imagine <laughs> what i'm going to say sure, yeah. um so they had two images uh or of, of ads basically it was everything was the same except for the baby on it so in one ad the baby was looking towards you so it's, you had a fa it was facing you but on the other ad the baby was facing the text and so one could argue that you want to have the baby facing towards you because it attracts attention and we like babies and we like people looking yeah, at sure, us. Yeah. Although one other interesting insight is that we have whites in our eyes, which sort of like sounds a bit weird. But the reason why we have whites in our eyes is so that you can see where I'm looking because mm. my iris is... Um, my pupil, sorry, is is visible, mm. and so we live. We used to live in groups, and therefore, um, it was really handy for you to know uh, if something was happening over there, because that could be something that you should fly from, or uh, you should want to have, right? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, and so, with that sort of uh, knowledge in mind, we know that people look where other people are looking, and so uh -huh. the ad where the baby was facing us. We, see th we saw that the text and the, the product actually on it wasn't viewed as much. Uh -huh. But when you looked at the baby when he was looking at the text, all of a sudden the text was also viewed more prominently. Yeah, prominently. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But it's a good segue into what you guys do. Uh, yeah. So could you explain a little bit about what you actually try to provide for your clients? Yeah, so in the, if you look at the basic, what we really want to provide to our clients is to have a more or a better outcome of their marketing, so more effective marketing. Uh, and we 
try to achieve that by looking at psychology, basically on studies that has been done, have been done, sorry, or studies that should, uh, that we should do. Mm. So on the one hand, we do consultancy, all based on those evidence-based insights that we have on how to steer human behavior with great results already in that. For example, Corpus, which is a attraction slash museum in the Netherlands, uh, where we improve the conversion of the physical store with 54% per visitor, which oh is yeah. amazing. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I've, I'd never thought it would be that high, of course, but it was really great. And that was more on the consultants, uh, consultancy side. So we just gave them a lot of knowledge that we already had on consumer behavior that they could uh, apply right away. Uh, but sometimes you first want to do research first. Mm -hmm. and that's why we also do research, but it's not research... Um, like in a broad sense, it's really targeted because we do research with EEG. Mm, okay. And uh, uh, getting back to that uh, that case that you mentioned with the museum. Yeah. Um, so how did you go about that? So how does that work when you get this kind of a, an assignment from a client that says, okay, I want to see if, for example, how my store is laid out, if that's if that's working or not. H how does that work? So how does how do you approach that? Yeah, so in this sense, on the consultancy part, we have to look at it from our uh, the knowledge that we already have, right? Uh, and so when, for example, when we walk into a store and we see that uh, the layout is, um, how would you say that, it's tended to go towards a width clockwise yeah. instead of counterclockwise, um, we know that people were, uh, generally walk counterclockwise. So when we already see that the layout is layered differently, we know, hey, this is a point where can you where you can improve. Yeah. And why so, is that actually with the counterclockwise part? Just to so, make a little segue. Yeah. Well, and I'm sorry to say, but a lot of things we just don't know actually. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of uh, insights, especially from the EEG research, from the brain waves, that we see a drop in positive emotions. So basically, it's a negative emotion. Yeah. And we don't. 100% know why. Yeah. For to really know why, we should do more research based on that specific yeah. uh, insight. And most times, our clients just want to know, hey, that's a negative part, cut it out, replace it with something positive. Okay. That's way too general, but as an insight. Um, and so, why people walk counterclockwise, maybe there's a uh, science behind it that we could look up. Uh, I don't know it right yeah, now. Sure, actually, yeah. <laughs> we'll have a look. But I, 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 to get back to that approach, so um, th that's one of the the obvious things that you that you see. But how yeah. do you uh, look into that further? So how do you look into further uh, investigating why something works and something doesn't work? Yeah. So th the way we approach it normally with the consultancy uh, um, assignment is that we um, yeah we we just scan the whole area and we look for things that we know that doesn't work that don't work um and there's a lot of knowledge already available on stuff that sure. doesn't yeah. work so that's the stuff where we have to rely on then but also sometimes it's just uncovering what's already there but what isn't told yet so um one thing that really works in bookstores is the top 10 yeah thing, right sure. of books yeah um and this is something that you can easily apply in other stores as well and this is something that's already present, right? There is a top 10 of books or items that are sold. And the only thing that you have to do is to display it. Ah, okay. So, for example, in that museum, uh, I don't know if they did that already, but that could be like our top 10 sellers or something like that uh, of uh, kind of souvenirs or whatever that yeah, you want. Could so, be, yeah. um, could you, because that's that's a little bit, it's hard to explain, you t told me about the EEG uh, that you that you do, but could you explain a little bit how that works? So um, what do you, how do you apply that actually? So uh, EEG is actually, uh, it's kind of a science to record brain waves or something like that, right? A little bit uh, easier explained, but uh, could you tell me how you kind of apply that to, to projects that you do? Yeah, sure. So... Maybe it's it's handy to um, start at the end, basically, because sure, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what would you want to know in that sense? And um, let's focus for now on uh, commercials. Yeah. So TV ads, uh, two other areas that we you do is in-store research and uh, usability research. But let's start off with uh, um, commercial research. Mm -hmm. Basically, there are the two things that you want to know. The first is, is my ad going to make an impact, a positive impact on sales? And... Uh, one would say, of course, it will have a positive impact. Well, there are a lot of studies, and this actually really, yeah, well, I'm not going to say scared, but it amazed me. 
that one third of all ads have a negative impact on sales. That's so right. these are commercials on television. And these are studies published by Nielsen and uh, the bigger companies that have the, the vast amount of data on really what people saw and what they actually bought. Um, and so that's, for my mind, it, it blew my mind because one third of all ad spend is just mm. thrown away. It has a negative impact. And so one third has a neutral impact. So not really positive, not really negative. Also, not that great. No. And so only one third that is left has a positive impact. Uh, and I'd say before you spend hundreds of thousands of euros or even millions of euros on your ad on TV, yeah, you want to know <laughs> on which money, side. money well spent, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and well, this is something actually really interesting because would you really want to know it when you made the ad already, when you put mm. all that effort in it? Uh, and that's why with a lot of companies that we work with, we are an integrated part of the whole process. Mm. Because actually, when you do the research, uh, you can find out that the fixes are rather easily established. And so that's also the second part of why you want to do this kind of research, because you want to know which scenes of the ad can I optimize, right? Because we know, for example, hey, it scores below our benchmark, so it has the negative impact. What can we do to fix the ad to make it better, to mm. make it have a positive impact? Um, and that's why we use EEG, because it has two main advantages. The first is that a lot of study has been done on the sales impact or the predictive value of sales impact. Um, so we know that 60% of sales variance actually can be explained by the research with EEG that we do. So that's already one really big motive to do this. Yeah. And so the other one is that with EEG, we make a, a 265 um, measures per second. So we have a very clear view millisecond per millisecond, what people feel when they view the ad. So that's the more broader picture. And then, so what we measure basically is, is indeed brain waves. Um, and there are four yeah, emotions. One could say it's not really, it's not really great to say, but emotions... Yeah, they, it's they, nuanced, but you, you, the yeah, it feels four, right. There's four main uh, yeah. kind of uh, characteristics, right? Yeah, and so the first one is emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is engagement that's the amount of attention you put into it the third one is workload whether or not you think it's really difficult or not and it has a um, how could you say it a sweet spot so too low is not good because then people aren't paying attention at yeah. all or not processing in it and too high also means they sort of block out and so the last one is confusion and it basically is when something happens what you didn't expect mm. not per se negative because it can be negative, of course, but you have to look at the other metrics to see how you should interpret it. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that, that's interesting you say that because uh, what what I do, what a lot of people say is that actually the bad ad, so bad in a sense that you are like, okay, why did you even make this ad? Like it, the, the bad ads uh, or the... Not the bad ad, ads, actually. It's more the annoying ads <laughs> pe yeah. that people find annoying actually stick the most, right? It, 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 the, a lot of people say that. Does that. Is that something that you see as well, or is it actually contrary to that? Well, the thing is that, first off, could you really trust people on their what they say on what they really do? Yeah. Because it's really easy to say, hey, this ad is really annoying, but does it also uh, ensure that you don't buy the product? Um, and to look back at the research that has been done on self-report, we know that actually people don't do what they say and they don't say what they do. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the sales variance that can be explained by self-report is really low. So already there's one thing that you can say, okay, it's interesting that you say, hey, I don't like this ad, but I know that it doesn't really tell me something about your purchase behavior afterwards. Um, and so there's also research that's of course been done in annoying ads. And we all know those annoying ads for uh, cleaning products, for example. Yeah, sure. Um, and while the interesting thing is that especially for that uh, type of products, functional products, annoying ads do even work. Um, so it's not always the case that annoying ads are bad per se. Mm. I would say that you would have to research that by looking at the subconscious, uh, like the EEG that we do. You can also do it with uh, fMRI. 
But yeah, what we basically see, and this is something um, with the film trailer study that we saw as well, uh, what we see is that people don't do what they say and they'll say what they do. Mm. So you, yeah, always when people tell me stuff like that, basically when it's more of the emotional side, so I don't like it or I think it's annoying, I know I don't really have to sort of listen to it because I know they don't really act on it. Yeah, the data will show something different. Uh, that's that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. And so, uh, sorry. Yeah, there's, a one, yeah. there's this one study that we just finished and I think it's really cool. Uh, we did a film trailer study. Uh, and so we uh, invited some participants into our um, uh, yeah, our lab. It's a, it's a house <laughs> room lab, so the house camera lab in Dutch. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a room, yeah. it's a living room lab. Yeah. Maybe mi- is it kind of mi- does it mimic a living room that you would yeah. typically see? Yeah, yeah. So to let people be at ease, right? Mm. Um, and so we let them see some uh, trailers, and afterwards, after each trailer, we asked them, "Hey, would you want to see this movie? Yes or no?" Um, and we did it with a bunch of trailers with a bunch of people. Um, and we correlated that with the sales of the, um, the, 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 the film in the first weekend, right? Because um, afterwards, maybe word of mouth has a big impact, yeah, uh, sure. the budget that has been spent. So the, first, the sales in the first weekend and opening weekend are really predictive um, for that. Um, and we wanted to know how does what people say correlate with their spending behavior? And so the correlation sort of goes from minus one to plus one. And I would sort of, beforehand, I thought, okay, it's going to be really low, like on the 20% side, which has, uh, other studies have shown. But what we found is that the predictive value was minus 0.4, which basically means if people say, yeah, I wanted to go see the movie, we see that they don't spend their money on it. <laughs> That's crazy, yeah. That's really crazy. Yeah. And so the, uh, the combined... Uh, metrics that we uh, looked at because it was a replication study of a study that has been done in Rotterdam um, we had a predictive value of 0. 0.6 mm. which is also really on the high side, high side of yeah. Yeah, what we can predict so that's also really awesome yeah yeah, yeah the, the, the thing that I'm um, I'm curious about as well is that uh, so you use these kind of techniques to or technologies to uh, record those brain waves and stuff like that so uh, how do you kind of uh, make that into quantitative data that someone can use to make their marketing better or whatever. So how do you kind of present that to, to someone? And uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you actually present that? Yeah, so if you look at EEG, um, there would really be like a bunch of data. I think a few million points of data come in every second. Uh, so you have to make sense of that, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, and so our software is able to, to really make an awesome graph out of it. So we stack uh, everyone, so we uh, all the participants that we uh, measure uh, is stacked. We have a timeline for the f- for the ad, and we basically have a graph of lines going up and down uh, on that emotion. So the the most important one, desire, which has the biggest predictive value of sales, uh, you can just see on a commercial when one scene is there, the positive emotion is up, but when another scene is there, it's down. For example. Ah, um, okay. And I was, but because you mentioned kind of the four emotions that you kind of pick to, um, so do those kind of factor together to get to that desire part, or how, how does that work? So is, is it the combination of those uh, four that you have, or how, how does that work? So no, in the sense in that um, each emotion that we measure is based on an algorithm that we mm-hmm. have. Yeah, sure. It's an algorithm that is uh, scientifically published. So we, it's not our algorithm, but it's an algorithm that has been agreed upon between all universities around the world. Sure, yeah. Um, for us, it's really important. It's not just something that we use. It's something that <laughs> it's everybody uses. It's something you made up. <laughs> well, that as well. But you can imagine that, uh, for example, you can have like one university that does sort of a small research yeah. with you. And then, yeah, one research basically isn't... Uh, Doesn't say anything. Yeah. yeah, one paper isn't enough to really state something. So mm. you have to have multiple papers, and we have it on those uh, measures. Um, so each measure is is one individual calculation of the brain waves, uh, and basically what desire is, and this is really interesting, it's the uh, prefrontal asymmetry. Okay. So uh, don't get confused with prefrontal lobe 
where basically the more rational mind is because yeah. that's not what we measure uh we measure the activity uh, difference based on the left hand side compared to the right hand side and the strange thing is we can only measure this with right-handed people because for some but not all left-handed people it's the other way around so <laughs> okay <laughs> that's really weird yeah. um and so i'm left but my brain in that sense is wired like a right-handed uh, person uh, but yeah a lot of left-handed uh, persons have it the other way around mm. and of course there's only 20 percent people left-handed so what we normally do is we exclude them from the research ah okay and the the uh, so how do you how do you see that kind of desire uh, within those kind of brave brain waves? Because that's that's a little bit hard to abstract. Because, of course, you see all these points of data and you see everything coming in. But how do you know that it's kind of a that it's that that particular thing is actually desire? How, how do you yeah. do that? Yeah. So and maybe desire is a bit overstated or a bit simf- yeah, simplified okay. as well. Yeah. Um, in science, we we normally call it approach or avoidance motivation. And that already makes it a bit clear. Yeah, um, sure. And yeah. you can see it a lot in the data as well. When something scary happens, for example, when there's a dog that is growling, you know, it's like, <sighs> we can see an avoidance motivation. What makes sense, of course, because people don't like uh, to be threatened. Yeah. Threatened. And so, um, but we also see it the other way around. When we see cute babies, we see an approach motivation because that's what people like. Mm. Um, so when you see the data, it actually makes sense most of the times. And, uh, of course, the real gold uh, can be found in the times where you don't have a, a, a priori think thought of, okay, this is going to be positive or negative. All the while, you see it's really negative. Yeah. And that's, of course, interesting stuff because then you know, hey, I should fix this. And uh, what's what's... Kind of what I what I'm thinking about while you're telling this is that um, what I'm more interested about as well is that people have all all have different characters, right? So everybody has their own specific kind of char- characteristics and why they yeah. do stuff. And some people are more daring and want to do more extreme sports and stuff like that. Uh, do you also see uh, a difference between those people and kind of the the results that you get from uh, your research? Yeah, so one would sort of think that, yeah, you, there's a lot of interpersonal differences. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but if you look at it more from the, um, yeah, the, the EEG side, what we measure is more of like a real basic emotion. So everybody is scared by a lion that is suddenly approaching you. Um, and so you can, I, I think generally you can split it up into two things. Uh, things that we all think are scary, that are sort of baked in. Yeah. And things that we learned, right, by association. Uh, so we see people, for example, with um, that love how would you, roller coasters. Um, we actually see that they have a positive emotion in the roller coaster. All the other people that don't love roller coasters have a negative emotion. Mm. So there is a difference over there. Uh, but, for example, um, we did a study specifically with moms, with kids under the two, uh, age of two. Um, and we saw them uh, having extreme values uh, in the data. So when they saw a baby, it was re- extremely high. When a baby was in danger, even it was just... Um, so when I say it, it sounds like real danger, but it's, it, in the ad, it looked cute. There was this baby, you know, they were swimming with his mom. And so we know that a baby has a lung reflex. So when you, um, yeah, you take a deep dive with the baby or you, yeah, you take it underwater, it's fine. You know, the baby just smiles and it's, it's swimming. So we know that. But I already, as you can see, you sort of have to explain that, okay, you know, it's not just pulling a baby on the water, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that, you know, that doesn't work well. Yeah. But when you see it, it looks sort of okay. But what we saw is that the moms, when they saw it, they had a really negative emotion. What makes sense, of course, because yeah. they felt... They have uh, their kind of maternal yeah, insides. Right. That, that and so on. we thought, will this be the same for the non-people uh, in the target audience? So we did the same study with people ranging now from uh, from uh, like the normal audience right so we're uh, men and women with and without children from all ages and we saw the same direction of uh, results not as extreme as the moms but we saw the same results so in a lot of stuff we are basically the same mm. yeah 
Yeah, that's crazy because you would say that, uh, for example, people that do kind of extreme sports have less fear than someone else, right? You would, yeah. you would say that. For, and and you, you know. probably you will see that as well, right? Mm-hmm. As with the example with the roller coaster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's sort of learned. Yeah, yeah, that's um, kind of, uh, you know that it's safe, so you're a little bit more comfortable than you are maybe when you're doing the first time, right? Uh, probably, yeah. I don't like lo- roller coasters, to yeah, be yeah, honest. Yeah. And I, I, would, I wouldn't know how that would f- feel at all to, to be in one. So I can imagine that my reaction would be a lot, um, yeah, it would be a lot more than someone else, uh, for example, that uh, is used to it, that yeah, does yeah. it every every time. So... Uh, you mentioned the usability research as well. So mm-hmm. actually looking at uh, is something usable or not. Uh, could you explain a little bit about what you do in that kind of area? Yeah, sure thing. Because uh, this is a really new and upcoming field. Mm-hmm. Uh, commercial testing has been done uh, for a long time now. First with surveys and now more with neuromarketing research. Uh, but for the usability part, it's fairly new. Um, and I don't think it's going to be really used. And maybe it sounds a bit weird when I say it, because we, of course, also uh, use this for our clients. <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, But it does happen that I uh, advise against it, in the sense that I say, first do normal usability research. Um, and if you look at what you uncover with the brains or with EEG research, it's a small humps. Um, and so this is, these are uh, really important for bigger sites like Kublu or Amazon, right? Because they don't have huge issues that prevent people from buying. That's basically what you have to think of. Um, and so if you've never done usability research just by, uh, for example, even standing by people or uh, something uh, up, you know, the, in the sense that you would do eye tracking and just see where people are looking at the website, you will gain tremendous insights that have a really big impact on your sales eventually. If you look at the neuromarketing part, you'll see stuff like that maybe paying hurts. Typically stuff that people can't really pronounce, right? They don't yeah, know that sure. paying hurts. Yeah. And if you fix it, we'll see an uplift in your conversion. But those uplifts generally are around 2 maybe 5%, which for a lot of websites is way too small to be even detectable because they don't have enough conversions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so for a lot of websites, it doesn't really make sense to do the usability research. But again, for a lot of websites, it does. For example, for Kublu or Ball.com, the bigger websites. Yeah, but where you- a few percent can make a real difference in their total yeah. amount that they sell. Yeah, for the, for the Dutch listeners, um, you should go to the website of Kublu and look at a product that has a discount. Uh, because we did... Uh, some usability research for them, and this is stuff that they uh, really applied. And as you will see, the um, especially for a product that has discount, normally this is viewed in the sense that the new price is bigger and the old price is smaller, right? Mm. And it sort of makes sense because people think that you would want to see the new price and not the old price because that's higher. But we also know from a psychology standpoint that when you first view the, the higher price, the lower price actually seems lower because you first saw, for example, 500 euros and now it's only 350. Mm. Um, So there is something to say to uh, put more emphasis on the old price. And so what we advise them to do is to make the old price even bigger than the new price, which is exactly the other way around that you see everywhere else. Yeah, that's, that's crazy because you would, yeah, that... It seems totally logical when you really think about it. That's what you already mentioned, is that some things are counterintuitive, right? Yeah. You think this is not going to work ever. Yeah. <laughs> you actually see that it has a con- bigger conversion rate, yeah. right? And, and I was wondering about the... So in some cases, some websites, uh, they kind of remove the decimals as well. So they say, okay, it's not 350.99 uh, or something like mm-hmm. that. They would just say 350, lose the decimals at all. Yeah. Are, are those kind of things that you also look at so to see if that also works? Or Yeah. And and um, so uh, to get back to the cool blue point, yeah, sure. by the way, uh, just to say real quick, if you look at the website, you'll see that they uh, actually, they set it live. So what tells us, it, that tells us that they actually found in an A-B test that it has That's a significant... Right uplift and i know from uh sources within that it indeed it was quite small around the two three percent range which is for kublu of course really high 
but for a lot of websites, undetectable, right? Yeah. Um, if you look at the, the decimal points, that's a really interesting uh, point. I could talk for hours about pricing, actually. <laughs> uh, hey, we, we got the time. <laughs> yeah, well, there has been a lot of research on, on pricing. So it's, it's, it's a too straightforward to say to always lose the decimals. Sure. But, for example, if you have a, pri- a product that is uh, priced 20 euros, right? A lot of websites write it out in a sense of two... Uh, zero dot zero zero yeah and what we know from psychology and this is really interesting and this is something that you can apply uh, apply in other stuff as well is that um and this is called uh, now i have to think about it uh, cognitive embodiment Mm. and basically what cognitive embodiment means is that uh, some stuff that we feel in the physical world translates to our mental image so a friend that lives far away also feels like a more uh, uh, emotionally further away friend. Ah. Makes sense, right? Yeah, it makes sense. So, and if you look at prices, if you write out 20.00, the price is big. If you write out 20 dash, it's smaller. So we know from research already that when the price is smaller in font size, and in size actually, it also feels smaller emotionally. <laughs> Um, so if you if you have pricing and you you can't do anything, for example, you're not able to um, to lower it one cent because that's another thing that we know that uh, although like you, 1999 or something right, like that, yeah, it has an impact because people look at the first digit, so it went from 20 to sort of 10 euros. So it feels like a one euro discount or maybe even 10 euros. Yeah, although it was only one cent. So there's way more stuff to say about prices per se. But for the decimal uh, point, yeah. Yeah, it, it has impact because, uh, for example, I was in a store, um, I don't know when it was, but a few days ago, and then there there was a price, it was like, I think it was like 4.98 or something like that. And we're like, oh yeah, 4 euros. And it's not 4 euros, it's actually 5 euros, but just yeah. 2 cents less than that. So um, what, what we talked about a little bit before we started recording is the... Uh, what kind of impact, and that's also something you measure in those kind of usability tests, what kind of impact uh, website performance has as well on uh, the human uh, human psyche. So um, could you tell a little bit about that? Because you did some studies on that as well uh, to see what kind of impact that has on someone's uh, perception of a website. Yeah, so the general uh, knowledge, of course, comes from Google, uh, who say that, hey, if you increase the site, uh, the site speed, you increase conversions. And that is totally true, of course. But there are cases where you maybe want to hold down information and maybe not show information as fast as uh, you think. Um, and the reason why I um, uh, why we dug into this was because of chatbots. And if we want to, we can go into deeper uh, sure, go uh, ahead. Yeah. even. Um, but first, um, yeah, let's just look at Google, right? Um, if you if you have a search uh, query. They come up with tens of millions of results in just 0.4 seconds. So they can give it really, uh, they can give it back really quick. If you look at Skyscanner though, and you um, uh, you type in a search query, for example, Amsterdam to New York, um, you could say that if they have the same processing power, that they could also give all the results in 0.4 seconds. Yeah, and it's really quick yeah which but, is actually annoying to a lot of people i think that they have to well at least for me it's annoying when i'm going to kind of a travel website and i'm like okay i'm still waiting for my results like yeah but uh, go ahead yeah it, it has a deeper meaning right yeah well so the thing is that we know from research that when it takes a bit of time to get the results it really feels like the computer is really working for us yeah. so the results feel more valuable and that's what actually um, Skyscanner found as well. If they take a bit more time to show the results, it feels like they really did the work for you. And so their service feels more valuable. And there's one interesting thing in that as well that also works here, because the first results that they show, uh, and this is true for Skyscanner, of course, is the direct flight, which is mostly the most expensive flight, right? And after that, after a while, you see the new, uh, the the cheaper flights pop up, and then all of a sudden you think, oh, oh, nice, uh, I'm cheaper, right? Or uh, it's more affordable right now. And what we know what this does is is a, um, a theory called anchoring. 
And basically what anchoring means is that when you think of a, a large number, you also tend to think about larger numbers after that. Uh, so they did a study with people, they had them wrote down the last two digits of their phone number to uh, to see, uh, just to say it, that is totally random because, yeah. right, you cannot uh, really influence it. And then they asked people to state how much they would p- be willing to pay for a cup of coffee that was standing there on the table. And what they found was that when people had a higher number that they first filled out, they were willing to pay more for the coffee than the people with a lower number. <laughs> That's sick, yeah. And so, right, it's a random number that influenced them. It's a higher number that influenced them to think of a higher number. And that's also the same that works for Skyscanner. They first see the biggest price, the highest price of the flight, and then they see the lower prices. So the high price works as an anchor. So everything you view after that is viewed in regard of the higher price. And so yeah. it feels cheaper. Yeah, and you feel like you've been, you've come better out than <laughs> than you actually maybe are. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you you mentioned chatbots, but what what do you want to what did you want to to talk about on that uh, perspective? Yeah. So uh, the reason why I, I said it was because um, the waiting time. If you um, if you look at a chatbot from a psychological st- uh, point of view, you want it to be human like, right? Um, and so one thing that is human like is also that something that takes a bit of effort takes a bit of time. Um, and so for the chapel, what you don't want to have is that when somebody asks a question that you immediately give the answer, same as Google, right? 0.4 seconds. But now you don't want to do that. You want to take a bit of time before you really, uh, you give the answer back because then it feels more human-like. And mm-hmm. you can test this out on Facebook, for example. They, they tested this, of course. Um, and you can see that when you send them a question and you are chatting with the bot, it takes a bit of time. You have these dots that are also sort of going up and yeah. down. Um, loading kind of a loading thing kind of loading yeah and what we know is that it makes us feel more human-like and so the interaction is is viewed more positively mm. yeah and that's also something that you kind of uh looked into for probably a case that you already did right yeah so a lot of stuff we see it yeah, yeah. so um and this was yeah, you know, we cannot talk about everything, of course, but yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we we do indeed do research. Again, uh, also, first, the chatbot has to be good. So what we always say is we make good marketing even better. Yeah. Um, but when we look at it and it's all in place, technically, we can improve it by looking at how people interact with it. Yeah, yeah. So you already need to, you already need to do it correctly if you want to be able to kind of have more you have more impact when it's done or when it's done correctly already right that's the that's the whole idea behind your kind of thing that you want to do yeah i really have to rely on good marketeers that make good products sure uh and and actually we aren't that good as making uh, something from zero to good but we are really good at making something that is good even better yeah yeah because it's uh, these things uh, and that's something that we need to state I think these things are um, especially interesting when you have high volume, right? Uh, it, it it shows more when you have high volume and it has more impact in that moment, right? Yeah. Well, you have to... Um, what I really like is the conversion pyramid. Sure. Um, and to, to make it a bit more visual for the listeners, uh, if you look at the conversion pyramid, uh, the bottom things is, is like the, the foundation, right? Uh, and basically sometimes it comes down on uh, the proposition, the, the, the value that, that you deliver to customers. It has to be there because otherwise you don't have a product. And if you look a bit higher, you know, the, the base gets a bit smaller, but you look at a more functional website. And then uh, a bit higher, you look at more usable website. People have to be able to put something in the basket sure. or even to get stuff out. It has to work. <laughs> it has to work. And it's sort of, it. Uh, of course it has to work. But we know that if it doesn't work and you fix it, you see an uplift of maybe 200%. Or maybe a thousand percent if people weren't even able to buy, right, or to pay. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so if you go higher and higher in this pyramid, you end up in the two top layers, and the one beneath the top is more of like the uh, persuasion, so the behavioral side uh, of stuff. Um, things like social proof, scarcity, things like that. Sure. Have a sort of big impact. Uh, but not as big as the functional part right, of the website. And if you look at the top of the website, that's where the, the brain science kicks in. So leaving out the euro sign, for example, we know that from brain science, 
seeing a euro sign actually hurts. So yeah. the same brain regions lit up. Um, so letting it uh, or removing it makes sure that there there is less pain and so more conversion. But it's only two to three percent big or large. And so you're you're totally correct in the sense that if you have a high volume, you it will be a noticeable effect. And it will have an impact. Mm. If you are a small baker around the corner, it doesn't have that much of an impact. Yeah, that that's crazy. That's crazy because um, you, you don't think about it that way when you're browsing a website, right? I mean, everything you do is kind of subconsciously, you're doing it subconsciously, right? As you said, when you leave out the euro sign, um, I think, for example, if you do a bigger purchase, especially if you do a bigger purchase, I think, uh, say, for instance, something costs 400, 500 euros, right? If you have that euro sign, I'm like, okay, 500 euros, man. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 kind of a, that's kind of a stretch for the, this kind of item or whatever. But if you leave it out, it does, uh, I, I can see why that, that has an impact on your kind of psychology where you think that, okay, uh, this is a lot less than, than it actually is, right? Yeah. And so maybe what's also interesting is that how... Um, uh, we we tested a lot on website in A/B test, mm. and this one time we saw a negative effect leaving out the euro sign, and we were like, "What? I mean, it should always have a positive effect, not a negative effect, right?" Uh, and this is also really important to think about because um, the positive side is a small uplift, right? But the negative side in this case was a downfall of twenty percent. Mm. Uh, and what we thought happened is that people didn't notice that it was a price anymore. So when you looked at a product that was like 500 euros, you knew 500 euros is the price of the product. But in this case, the price, um, the numbers basically, were, were at an odd place. It was not like a normal uh, web shop where it's, you know, usually at the same place. This was at a, at a different place. And so we think that people were confused about what the number meant. Because with the euro sign, it, it has meaning to you. It yeah, like, oh, it's you know, uh, yeah, you know it's a price. Yeah. And now it's just like 15. And then we're like, 15 what? 15. <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, that's really important to think about as well. The bigger effect sizes of confusion, for example. Yeah, yeah so it would, it would be confusing if you have multiple numbers on the page, for, for example, or something like that. Yeah, well, it, especially when it's not clear where they're... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. where they're for. Yeah, if you have a product page and it's always in the same spot, you can kind of know that it's, it's right. a price, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I want to talk a, bit, a little bit about the future, so what you think uh, will be happening within your field. Uh, so what do you see there? So what are kind of the things that are getting bigger and bigger within your... Because it's a pretty new field you're in anyway. Uh, yeah. So, what what do you kind of see happening there? So, what what are the kind of the newer things that you uh, see clients that are going to use or whatever? Yeah. So, I think there are two directions, and uh, both really interesting. The first one is VR. Now, it's VR on per se is not that new, of course, because VR has been around for quite some while, uh, quite some time. But now, only recently, a few months back, the hardware was brought out to have. Uh, solid eye tracking or really um, measurable eye tracking, right? Uh, so, good eye tracking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, couldn't find the word better, there. B- better than what there was before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because normally eye tracking in VR, what it should do is that it knows, oh, you're sort of gazing here, so I know I should uh, um, calculate where you're looking at and not the other parts, so it's less processor uh, heavy. Yeah. While the eye tracking that we want to have is to really know, to pinpoint where you're looking at, to know that exactly that's the point that's that you're looking at. Yeah. yeah. And so um, that has only been brought out recently, so we're now we have a supermarket in VR where we uh, can see where people are looking when we you know, let them walk through a supermarket, which is really awesome because uh, if you would have to do in-store research, you would have to have a store, one, uh, but you'd also, if you want to have multiple variations of a shell, for example, you have to build it. You have to, eh, it's it's really labor intensive. Yeah, sure. And now, you have to change your store up every time you want to change something. Yeah, and you want to research it. And sometimes sure. it's even stuff that you don't want out there, right? Mm. And so that's where VR comes in, and that's really interesting. Uh, so that's one area that I see will be growing. Another area uh, that will be growing is um, the... Online ads affecting offline sales, but also measuring it. Um, because something interesting is going on. We see that a lot of traditional uh, advertising agencies are sort of on a decline, right? Because 
uh, there's not a lot of TV commercials anymore. People uh, tend to watch more online. Uh, so we see that happening over there. We also see on the other side the more digital agencies that are uh, in the rise. And they are used to data. People clicking on ads, making the sale. Yeah. Um, and if you have that, that, well, it's interesting because you're only looking at the sort of the last click, right? The last attribution of what you think made this uh, campaign work. But what we know from psychology is that advertising has a really big impact in whether or not people will buy. Uh, and so we saw this with one client, for example, uh, where two digital marketeers uh, were hired and they immediately said, what is this the budget for the TV? Let's <laughs> cut it in half and put it into oh, online. Yeah. And what they saw when they did that, they saw sales immediately decline. So that was really interesting. We knew, we knew it, of course, already. But they saw that, indeed, advertising just the ads on TV work really well. Mm. Um, and so this is something that we uh, will see more and more, that the digital agencies that used to do more of the, the pay-per-click stuff are now thinking about, okay, so how does the branding part work? How can we influence shopper behavior without people clicking on the ad? And of course, this is really interesting for us again, because if people aren't clicking on the ad, how do you know it's a good one? And this, of course, we can measure again with the EEG. Um, and there's some really interesting research been done by a guy working at Yahoo. It's already 10 years uh, ago, but it was really cool. Yeah, Yahoo does. <laughs> Yahoo is the... I don't even if it's around anymore. I right? Know, but I don't know yeah. as well. But um, at the time, it was alive and kicking. Yeah. Sure. And so he did a major experiment. And this is really cool for psychologists uh, like me, uh, because he had an inclusion of 1.5 million people. Of That's course, crazy, yeah. Without them knowing, right? All Yahoo users. And what he wanted to know is, how does the online ads influence offline behavior and then you could do that experiment with all those people and he did it and he saw uh, indeed an increase in sales hmm. which is i mean it sort of makes sense right because why else would you do uh, ads yeah um but to have it tested on this skill is it's never been seen before yeah, because so, most studies are like, uh, even if you have 10,000 people, it's a, lo it's a lot, right? It's already a lot, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I, would, I would like to wrap up just to uh, ask you the, the final question. I ask everyone. <laughs> yeah. So what are, you, uh, what are you most proud of since you, you started this whole journey that you're on right now? So uh, I'm most proud of actually of building the company. Yeah. Um, uh, that's also because uh, I co-founded it with Tom. Tom is the genius. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think he likes it when I say it, because, <laughs> but he, the guy is just smart, right? Yeah. I think he could have done his PhD and become like a professor, uh, but instead he has it hard more on the creative side as well. Uh, but he's ridiculously smart. Um, and so his part is making sure that everything that we do is scientifically vetted and, yeah, that we do what we say what we want yeah. to do. Uh, and so my part is more focused on building the company. Uh, and in that regard, I would have never thought that we were already this big right now, that we were working for these brands and that we were right now we're growing year over year, um, like we're a hundred percent. So that's crazy. Yeah, That's crazy. And we want to maintain it for at least three more years, which is crazy. Yeah, that's, 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 that's cool because uh, how many people are working at the, at your company right now? Yeah, so right now we're with six. Yeah, sure. And so we're sort of small. Yeah. But if you look at it... But you from, work for big brands, right? Yeah. yeah. Like Heineken's, uh, Albert Heinz, yeah. Um, and so I, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, and all the while, six people sort of sound sort of small. Um, it feels like a huge... Um, how would you say it? So I, I have to take care of them, right? So a yeah. responsibility. Yeah, it's a, a responsibility, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, that's that's what you hear a lot from people that also maybe started the way you did, like with one or two people, and then at, then you are like, okay, we cannot deal with everything anymore, so we need to hire someone. Yeah, and then you're like, okay, really, I'm really responsible for this <laughs> this person's like well being and their livelihood, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we we have a, a business coach, luckily, uh, and I, I if there are other entrepreneurs listening right now, I would really advise on doing the same thing because. While we are good in uh, growing the company in the sense of that the, for the product, we know how the product works, 
we've never built a company before. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we want other people to hire us because we're experts in the field that we are, but we're not experts in growing a company. So we hired an expert to help us on that, which makes sense, of course. Yeah. But it was the best uh, decision that we ever made hiring him because he, yeah, he really told us where to look and how to, um, yeah, what things we should be looking at, what not, and how we could grow as fast as we're doing uh, right now. Yeah, and be- you get you get some pointers for someone that, uh, that already did it maybe before you, right? That's yeah. The, that's the big thing. Um, things like uh, applying the focus that you want, uh, focusing on particular thing that you want to do. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's that's great to to uh, end the, the podcast on. I think as a as a, a good uh, good advice to people that are listening at the moment. So uh, how can people find you? So uh, what uh, website can they find you on? So if you want to have my my personal website, it's just timzuidgeest.nl. Yeah, sure. Um, but you can also find us at STNT Research, or if you'd look at S uh, or Neuromarketing Research. Uh, in the Netherlands, I think you will find us uh, as well. Yeah, because you have an English uh, website as well, right? So for people that uh, want yeah. to to check it out. Um, sh- thank you for being here. Uh, it was great to have you on the show and also uh, great to talk about all these kind of things that I didn't even think we were going to talk yeah. about. That's really cool. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and for the listeners, uh, you can uh, find the Bits vs. Byte podcast on bitsvsbytes.com uh, and also on all major uh, podcasting platforms, so Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud. Um, and on social media, of course, it's all Bits vs. Bytes on uh, Twitter, Instagram and uh, LinkedIn. Thank you for listening and uh, until next time.